Well, we've been talking about the power of prayer, the power of prayer. And, and I want to share a little bit with you this morning. I, I tend to, if you, I don't know if you go back over the last uh, six years or so and look at all my sermons and look at the different topics, but I tend, if different pastors preach on different things, I tend to preach on prayer because I believe that if the church prays, God will hear an answer. And a prayerless church is a powerless church. A church that doesn't pray doesn't have power. And we want the power of God to be active and moving. And as I've told you, uh, and I want to explain it a little bit this morning before I, I, I really get into the heart of my message. I've told you that our church has a mantle of intercession over it. And... Uh, I know that there's a lot of reasons for that. I remember when I was young and I grew up in this church and I remember uh, hearing people and having prayer meeting and, and seeing God move divinely in, in, in prayer meeting, even when, as a little child and I'd go and I'd just be sitting back and they'd be all shouting and praying and, and seeing God do such great things. Some of you were saved because somebody came to a prayer meeting over and over and said, would you pray? Would you pray? Oh, would you pray for them? You know that? God did a work in your life, and you see what, what God did for you, but you don't realize all the time and the effort that it took for somebody else to pray. And when the saints of God pray, God moves. And I was brought up on that. I was brought up in a church of praying people. And that when something happened, as soon as there was a, 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 any situation or any need that people would just immediately, the first instinct was prayer. <coughs> And that ought to be our, our heart, our, our first instinct, ought to be prayer. And I, I want to tell you a little story. 16 years ago, it was October of 1999, and I was youth pastor, and uh, I was preaching in youth group, and some of you might have been in youth group at that time, and I was preaching, uh, the Lord had started in August to give me uh, just just these incredible words about the glory of God. And I was preaching about the glory of God and, and preaching about how we wanted more of God and more of God. And I would preach what I felt like the Lord gave me and there was an anointing on it, but then nothing would happen. I mean, I would preach and I'd feel the presence of God and then I'd give an altar call and, and not a whole lot was going on. And that went on for quite a while there. And I, I just, I remember coming in one night and, um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, tonight, I don't want you to preach. You're just going to come in, and you're just going to get students together, and you're going to pray. And I just want you to pray. And I thought at the time, I, I said, Lord, you don't understand. Did you ever tell God he doesn't understand? You ever tell God, God, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me educate you here, Lord. And so I started to tell the Lord, and I said, Lord, you don't understand. When these students come in, they're expecting, you know, we, we come in, and we do games, and we do kind of fun stuff, and then we do worship, and then I preach, and then they'll pray. But, you know, they're not going to just want to come and pray. They're going to come all just wanting to have fun, and it's going to be, a, I'm going to have to try and figure out how to get them to just get in this atmosphere of prayer. And at the time, we were meeting in the tiled hall, and you'd come down the hall, and we had these, these blue walls, you see them over there. They, they fold out and it kind of went around the side so that when you're coming down the hall that you had to walk around that to get into the youth group room. And as I'm walking down the hall, I remember when I came through the, the doors there from the old foyer and I'm walking, I'm just thinking and I'm talking to the Lord. I had a, another student who was kind of talking to me and I was half listening to them and half talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get these students to pray? And how am I going to do what you've told me to do? And I know what you've said, but I know that they're going to be focused on everything else. And as we came around, I walked around that blue wall. I could hear the kids in the room and I walked around. I came in and here in the room, I'm there. It's early. It's before youth group started. There's not even leaders there. There's just students there. And the, all the students that were there were gathered around already in a circle and they were praying. I don't mean they were just had somebody up there saying a little prayer and everybody had their heads bowed. I mean, these kids were in there. They were praying and the presence of God was already in the room. And 
and as these, these kids had started praying and they ushered in the presence of the Lord, all I had to do was come in and just start to say, guys, let's, let's all join. Let's, let's get praying. And we started to pray and the power of God started to move and kids started to just, I mean, they were on their faces before the Lord. And it wasn't just that Wednesday night, but it started to be something that happened and through the month of October, we'd come in and students were on their faces. I mean, they would be in, in, in puddles of tears on their faces on that, that tiled floor back there and they, w- they would come in and they would be pressing in and seeking God and God just kept saying do, do you want more? Do you want more? And we just said God we want more of you. The song that we just sang I want more of you God and we were getting desperate for God. It was October the 13th. It was a Wednesday night and God moved in such a powerful way and um, I just I thought you know Nobody else knows what's happening back here. You know, at that point, we, we had maybe 40 or 50 students back there. And I thought, you know, the people in the sanctuary, they don't even know what's going on back here. But God's moving so powerfully. And we were scheduled on that Sunday to start revival. And I knew that we were going to have revival Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the next week. And I didn't want to have revival services because I thought God's moving so greatly in youth group. I don't want to not have youth group. And I prayed and I said, God, would you please make the people that are scheduled to come preach revival have to cancel? Because I don't want to miss out on what you're doing because you're moving so greatly. Because again, I'm trying to tell God his business. And I'm like, God, I don't even really know these people. I only met them one time and they're older and our students are in, in revival. And, and if we miss, you know, maybe, maybe that we're going to lose what, the momentum that we have. So, so Jim and Judy Willett, Lord, they're scheduled to come and I don't want them to come. And I'm praying, Lord, please let them cancel. And they came on Sunday morning. They showed up. It was October 17th of 1999 and they showed up and they, they started into ministry that day and it wasn't a usual Sunday it wasn't at all a normal service and they we just had an incredible move of God on Sunday morning and then Sunday night and I mean man the the Holy Ghost moved on Sunday night and then on October 18th on Monday night I'll never forget that night as long as I live I'm up playing the keyboard and we had had a service and um Brother Willett, usually when he'd get up, he'd do some announcements and talk about tapes, and he couldn't even do that. He'd get up, and it just, there was just a flow of the anointing, and Sister Willett would preach, and he'd preach, and she'd sing, and they'd go back and forth. And that night, he preached, and then God moved in the altar. And then God just continued moving. And it wasn't an altar call that lasted for 15 or 20 minutes or a half hour. It wasn't a 45-minute altar call or an hour. It wasn't just an hour and a half or two hours long. It wasn't just a three-hour altar call. I'm, we, were, we were in. You know what I'm saying? And so we started at 7, and that night it was around 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And we're still there, and we're still praying. And most everybody had left. And I'm up at the keyboard, and I'd been up there playing. I'd played everything I knew to play. I'd sing everything I knew to sing and the presence of God. And, you know, most everybody had left. There was maybe only Valerie was there. And there was, there was just maybe just a handful of people that were, that were left in the room. And, and we're, we're still praying. And all of a sudden, I just, I'm up there and I'm, I'm playing. And I felt the heaviness of anointing. Do you ever, you know, the, the word for, for heaviness is the weightiness of his glory. And do you ever feel that weight of his glory? And I'm trying to keep on just playing and singing and I couldn't sing anymore and all I could do was play and then I couldn't hardly play anymore because it was just the presence of God and I was weeping and I just I remember I was just trying to just play the chord that I was playing and the presence of God just came in such a powerful way I couldn't stand anymore you ever get in God's presence when you can't stand anymore? And I couldn't stand anymore. And I just got driven down to my knees. And I'm on my knees and I still got my hands up on the keyboard holding this one chord. And I remember at the time I'm thinking, Lord, I want more of you, but I can't quit playing. And all I'm doing is going, and the people that were there, there was only, I don't know, maybe 10 people, 12 people left in the room. But I'm just holding on. And they're probably thinking, what in the world is he doing? And the, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody else probably paying attention because they're praying. And God just started speaking to me. 
And he just asked me this question. He said, do you really want more of me? And I felt a weight of his presence on me. A weight so much that it hurt. You ever travail in prayer until it's painful to your flesh? Some of you think I'm crazy right now because you've never experienced it. But God wants us to get to the point that we pray until it hurts. Until our flesh is hurting because our spirit man is groaning before the Lord. And, and I'm praying and there's a, almost like just something pressing me down. And I, I just fell in a heap behind the keyboard. And God said, do you really want more. And I knew as he's asking me that, that there was a pressure on me, but that the weight, the heaviness, if I said yes, was going to get worse. I knew that my flesh was going to hurt from this. Some people say, Pastor, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. But I'm telling you, if you haven't experienced it, I understand that maybe you don't know, but just you believe me. The Holy Spirit asked me that question, and, and I knew already what the result would be. And I said, yes, God, I want more of you. And when I did, the only thing, it's, it's funny, but the only way that I can describe it is in the old Bugs Bunny cartoons when they would have an anvil and they would drop an anvil on some. That's what it felt like to me. I was on the floor and it felt like there wasn't anything physically on top of me. But it just felt like something, just, just a heavy weight just came over me. And in that time, I started praying in a way I've never prayed before. I started seeking God in a way I had never prayed before. And as I was praying, I, the Lord took me from that little sanctuary over there. And I, 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 my spirit, man, was not there anymore. I knew full well where I was. I knew that my body was right there, but I was transported. And you've heard of people that have been to heaven. Your pastor was there. I was there. I was in heaven. I didn't just see a vision about heaven. I knew that I was there at that moment. I was in his presence. And there was worship going on. And it was the, 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 just the atmosphere and the feeling in that place to actually be in his presence, to actually be the thing that we had sought for. God, we want more of you to realize we've got fullness. There's fullness of worship. And it wasn't like there was any, there was no effort in worship. You didn't have to worry about anything. There was no care. There was no worry. It was just the fullness of the presence of the Lord. My mom had passed away and, and, and as I'm there, but I, I, I'm, I, I saw my mom, and my mom was there, and, and, and my, my, uh, her, her father, my grandfather, who had passed away, was there, and our son, who's in heaven, he was there, and I was worshiping around the throne, and I thought, this is incredible, this is just the presence of the Lord, and at the time, we had been seeking, God, we want more of your glory in our church, and I knew that, I, that my mom had prayed that for years, that she had been interceding and praying, there was, she was an intercessor, and she had prayed for the greater things to be poured out over our church. And when she got sick with cancer, she felt like she wouldn't die because, because she hadn't seen it yet. And that was one thing I'd questioned the Lord. Lord, why did she pass away before she saw it? And as I'm there, I, I actually saw our church from above. And it was just like a, a picture of, of glory, the anointing of the Lord that was being poured out. And my mom was interceding over our church. And I thought my mom's prayers for all those years and, and all the ones that have went before us that have prayed for all those years, their intercession was active and they're still in that, that, that uh, position of being an intercessor and praying over our church. Some of you now are thinking our pastors went crazy. He's just talking about crazy stuff. But I'm telling you that day, there was just this this heavy heaviness of, of, of a need to pray and to intercede over our church. And God just showed me he's pouring out, he's pouring out. And the more that we prayed, the more that he'd pour out, the more that we sought him, the more that he'd pour out and that he had greater things to do. And the Holy Spirit spoke a word to me. My mom was an intercessor. I've never been able to pray like my mom prayed. I, I know very few people that, that pray like my mom prayed, and she would never tell you that, but she was an intercessor. She was a prayer warrior. She led the ladies' prayer meeting, and she'd get up and she'd pray for four hours in the morning before she'd do anything. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, 
And he said, I am taking the mantle of intercession that was on your mother and I am placing it on you. And I didn't want to hear that. Lord, give me a mantle for something else. I, I'm, not, I'm not an intercessor. I've rarely met an intercessor who feels that they're good at intercession. But God's calling isn't about what we're good at. It's about us being available and him having the ability, right? God, God said those specific words in that way. He said, I'm taking the mantle of intercession that was on your mother and I'm placing it on you. Well, a whole lot more happened and by the time I kind of came back to myself, I was just laying on the floor and I was laughing. Just laughing in the presence of the Lord. And finally, when the ladies are, came up and they're trying to help me, and I'm staggering out of the church. If you would have saw it, it was what a sight. They're trying to, to get me, you know, back to some semblance of reality. And I got to drive home. And I remember the next morning driving out here to the church. And I stopped on the way out. And I thought, I'm never going to tell anyone what happened. Because they'll all think I'm crazy. Wasn't going to tell anybody about that. And I came out, some ladies are out here at the church and they're praying. And with God as my witness, one of the ladies after the prayer meeting, she said to me, she looked at me right in the eye and she said, Carson, I was praying for you and God said to tell you that he's taken the mantle of intercession that was on your mother and he's placing it on you. Now, when she said that, I looked at her with a confused look on my face. She probably thought, I was because I was just like, I can't believe God spoke that to me. I did not, it didn't come out of my mouth. I didn't say it, I didn't even say it by myself. I never said it to anyone. And I just kind of just stood there, thought, what in the world? Well, that night we had church, and I didn't tell anybody, but somebody spilled the means that we had had quite a service after Brother Willard had left. And he got up to preach that night and I'm back at the keyboard and he turned around and he just said in front of the whole congregation, God touched uh, Pastor Carson last night at the altar call after we all left. And Carson, I want you to share what God did last night. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, what in the world am I going to say? Because I can't tell everybody. Because they'll think I'm crazy. I tell them I went to heaven and all this kind of stuff. They're going to think I'm, I'm, he's off the deep end. We better look for a new youth pastor. And so I gave a little bit of testimony. But I didn't tell anybody anything like that. And then we were having church that week. And then later on that week, another one of the ladies, unbeknownst to the first lady that came to me, another one of the ladies were praying. And she said to me, she said, Carson, you know, I was praying for you. And this, with God as my witness, exact words, she said this. She said, God said to tell you that he's taking the mantle of intercession that was on your mother and he's placing it on you. And then I really thought, what is happening? Are these people talking about me? Did somebody hear something, you know? How could this have happened? And so I kind of just received the word and went on. Well, that Sunday, we came to church. We came to church on that Sunday. And I don't know if Georgia even remembers this. I haven't mentioned it to her again uh, here recently. But Georgia came up to me on Sunday. And she said to me, she said, Carson, I was praying this week. And God spoke to me. And God said... And here's the exact words that she said. She said, God said that he's taking the mantle of intercession that was on your mother and he's placing it on our church. Now let me tell you, I'm not just preaching something. When I preach about prayer, 
It's not just some sort of a theological idea. But if we'll pray, he'll hear from heaven and he'll answer. If this church will take the mantle that God has placed on us, and if we'll pray, I don't mean little patty cake kind of prayer, but if we'll get serious in prayer, if we will devote ourselves to God in prayer, he'll hear from heaven. God will do things that people can't explain. God will do that that is impossible, those things that aren't possible with man, they'll be done if the church will pray. Amen. God's called this church to pray. God's called this church to seek his face. Some of you say, well, I don't know if I want that. That's not for me. If you're part of the church, it's for you. Look around the room right now. You know who you're looking at? You are not looking at the harvest for this church. You are looking at the people that are called of God to pray for the harvest that he wants to come and fill this place to overflowing. Oh, come on. If we'll take the mantle that he's given us and if we'll pray. Listen, when you start running into walls, you know what you need to do? You need to pray. When you get a blessing in your life, you know what you need to do? You need to pray. When you get in the middle of a storm, you know what you need to do? You need to pray. When, when the doctor gives you a bad report, you need to pray. When your marriage is having trouble, you need to pray. When everything's going good, you need to pray. When your kids are struggling, you need to pray. When you wake up in the morning, you need to pray. When you lay your head down at night, you need to pray. If God's given you breath, you need to use the breath to call on his name. That's the reason reason that we're here, church. We're here because there's a mantle of intercession and God's called this church to pray. Amen. It isn't somebody else's responsibility. It's your responsibility and it's my responsibility and God's called this church to pray. You know, there are some things that we face and I don't know how to deal with them. Sometimes I, I think, boy, this happens. I don't know what to do. But I know this, when I don't know what to do, I just pray. And God does what I can't do. And God will start to speak to me about what to do that I would have never thought of. We, we have been, become way too reliant on our own intelligence, on our own ability, on our own thoughts, on our own will. And we need to rely way more on him, and way less on us. Anybody with me in that? It's almost time for me to close, so maybe I ought to read my text and preach a sermon to you. We've been preaching out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus said, In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A lot of people refer to that as the Lord's Prayer. But really, it's the model prayer that Jesus gave us that we need to be praying. We need to be praying the model prayer. And if you'll do this, it'll change your prayer life. And if you change your prayer life, it'll change your entire life. You hear that? So here's what we've talked about. We talked about the Our Father in Heaven, and that's the paternal part. We've talked about Hallowed Be Your Name, and that's the presence part where we pray the names of God. We talked about Your Kingdom Come, Your Will Be Done on Earth as it is in Heaven, and that's the priorities part where we get our priorities straight. We talked about the give us this day our daily bread, and that's the provision part of our prayer where God's going to provide. Somebody say amen. Amen. Last week we talked about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's the pardon part. And I'm not going to re-preach any of those because I've already preached on all of them. And this is the next to the last sermon. Next week I'm going to finish this up, the Lord willing. But today I want to preach on this section. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the protection part. 
This is praying the protection of God. You know God loves you and he wants the best for you? Do you believe it? God doesn't want your life to be filled with calamity. God doesn't want you to go through the flood and be overwhelmed and drowned. He doesn't want you to go through the fire and be burned. Now, you'll go through the water, but it's not going to overtake you. You're going to go through the fire, but you're not going to be burned. Let me just tell you, our church is under attack. Our church is under attack. There's a spiritual attack on us. There has been a spiritual attack on the leadership of this church. And over the last year, you can look at every single leader in our church and you can see attack after attack after attack. And let me just tell you, we've, we have lost a soldier or two in the battle. Amen. And I don't want us to leave them behind. We need to keep on praying. We, we should not be surprised that the devil attacks. There's been physical attacks. There's financial attacks. There's attacks on families. There's attacks. And I'll tell you what, every single one of them, I hate the devil. Don't you hate the devil? If I don't ever have to drive to Cleveland to another specialist with my daughter, I'll be happy. If I don't ever have to get another phone call of someone that's in crisis, if I don't ever have to be called to the hospital again, if I don't ever have to walk in a funeral home again, boy, that's going to be a good day, isn't it, when we're with the Lord and we don't have to worry about all that? If we're not careful, we see all these things as isolated events, and they're not isolated events. It is a coordinated attack of the devil. Let me, let me get a little bit political. This nation is under attack from without and from within. One of the enemies is militant Islam. Islam's not a peaceful religion. It was founded by Muhammad, and Muhammad was not a peaceful man. And as much as people want to say Islam's peaceful, there's one religion that's going around cutting people's heads off. And it's not Christianity, and the Christians aren't the ones that need to be lectured about it. And when we refuse to have leaders who refuse to even define the enemy, how can you win a battle? These are not random, isolated events that our nation is facing. It's not just random, you know, this one person over here, one person over here who did a random event. No way. This is a coordinated attack. And we've got to put the dots together and be able to say, this is our enemy. And we're going to attack our enemy rather than sit back and, and just have all these attacks come at us. Is that all right? Now let me apply it in the spiritual. When you see attacks in the church, when you see people that are hurting and that are struggling, you need to realize it's not just an isolated event. It is a coordinated attack of the devil. And we need to stand up and say, we are not going to sit passively by, but the church is going to rise in prayer. We are going to rise to the occasion and the spirit of God will move through the church. You need to hear this morning because the spirit of God is speaking. We will not be defeated as long as we stand true to him. We will not be defeated as long as we do not give up in the middle of the battle. Are you hearing me? Some of us have been wounded in the battle. 
We've got some battle scars, but we're going to keep on going and we're not going to leave others behind. We're going to pray and we're going to believe God and God will do the impossible. Craig, you're not fighting that battle alone. You've got a whole body that's surrounding you. Teresa, you're not going through this by yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our elders have been attacked. Our leaders have been attacked. If you're working in ministry in this church, you know what I'm talking about because you've been through the attack. And the attack may come in your body. It may come in your marriage. It may come with your kids or in your finances. It may come in your mind. But listen, you need to stand strong and you need to say, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. We need to make sure that we are covering ourselves and that we're covering our church and that we're covering one another in prayer. There is a need for the protective hand of the Holy Spirit over us. So that you know when you're going through the battle, you're not fighting that battle by yourself. I don't even have time to preach this, this part of it. This is future-focused prayer. So much of our prayer life is about the past or about the present that we're dealing with right now. We pray for our daily bread. It's present. We pray about unforgiveness. That's in the past. We pray about the things that we've been through. But then we come to this part, and he said, and do not lead us. And it's focused on where we are going. Do you see that? This is future focus. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a protective prayer for where we're headed. Because God has greater things, and the devil knows it. The evil one knows that God's got plans for you. That's why he's attacking you. Don't think it's strange that you're in this fiery battle, but he's coming against you because he knows that if you get serious and get on your knees in prayer, that the the windows of heaven are going to open. God's going to pour out blessing. There's going to be revival in Conneaut, Ohio. He knows that his kingdom is under attack. And so he is trying to, to attack and get the first strike in. But let me just tell you something. He's made a a horrible error in his calculations because when he attacks the church, the church isn't going to quit. We're not going to get up. We're not going to shut up. We're not going to stop. We're going to fall on our knees and we're going to pray like we've never prayed before. The devil is a defeated foe. He can keep on going about roaring, roaring, roaring. But let me tell tell you his teeth have done been pulled out jesus already said i i've already defeated him i've got the keys to death and to hell and the grave and the greatest thing that he could threaten you with is no longer a threat to you are you hearing me you are fighting a defeated foe It's a strategic error that the devil attack the church of the living God. The devil needs to get his hands off of God's property. You don't belong to him. You belong to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Let me just tell you, if you've been under attack, you need to take this part of the prayer and you need to say, God, you're leading me. You are my shepherd. You are directing me. And I'm not going to go down the path that he wants me to go down. I'm not going to go down the path that the devil's trying me to get to get me down and, and, and to try to just get me into defeat and get me to the point that I give up. I'm not going to do it. You need to pray God's leadership over your life. Every time you pray, you need to say, God, you're my shepherd. I'm not going to be in want. Lord, you make me to lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. You lead me in the paths of righteousness. Somebody say righteousness. 
to do what's right for your namesake. You anoint my head with oil. Mm. God's given a new anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Does anybody feel what I feel this morning? Mm. Mm. God is leading. God is directing. And even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he's with me. He's with me. I said he's with me. Hallelujah. His rod, his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, giving me a new anointing. Oh, you need to pray against temptation. You need to pray against the will of God. You know, temptation is not sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. If it was a sin to be tempted, then Jesus would have sinned because the Bible said he was in all points tempted just like we are. Jesus was tempted. Satan went to to see him after 40 days of fasting so that he could tempt him. But Jesus never sinned. Never one time did he sin. Temptation is not sin, but yielding to the temptation is sin. The devil puts it in front of you. You have to determine what you do with it. And if you yield to the temptation, then you place yourself out of the protective covering of the Holy Ghost in your life. So he said, I want you to lead me. God, my prayer is that you don't lead me into temptation. I'm not, you know, we don't have to, it looks like if you look at the verbiage that we're praying, God, please don't lead me to temptation as though God would lead us there. No, we're not praying. Here's what we're praying. God, if you lead me, then you will always lead me away from temptation. So I am saying, God, you lead. Because if my flesh leads, my flesh will lead me toward the temptation. So you lead me because whenever you lead me, you lead me away from the temptation. I'm inviting your leadership because your leadership will always take me away from temptation. Here's what we think. God's leadership takes me away from sin. I want you to catch it. He said, lead me away from temptation. Sometimes the problem is we we don't try to avoid temptation. We only try to avoid sin. We play around with temptation. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in, I've heard people say, you need to fight temptation. Nowhere in scripture does it say that we need to fight temptation. Scripture tells us we need to flee temptation. You fight the devil, you flee the temptation. I'll say it again. You fight the devil. You don't give, a, give ground to the devil, but you run. You flee as fast as you can from the temptation. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You need to start praying against not only sin, but you need to pray against the things that lead you towards sin. Is that good? Amen. Not just God, I don't want to commit adultery, but you need to pray, God, don't let me have lustful thoughts. You need to stop entertaining lustful thoughts. Is that good? Yes. Not just, God, I don't want to murder somebody, but God, I don't want to be angry with my brother or with my sister. Not just that I'm not, Lord, I don't want to just not attack somebody physically, but I don't want to gossip about them behind their back. Somebody say amen. amen. Not just the sin, but the stuff that takes you down the path. You need to avoid tempting situations, number one, and you need to avoid tempting associations, number two. I want you to get it. God, lead me not into temptation. I don't want to get in a situation that's going to cause me to sin. And secondly, I don't want to be around people who are going to draw me closer towards sin. Don't just say, I'm not going to sin. I don't want to sin. But you need to take steps that other people will, will say, you're crazy. 
People say, well, you can watch that. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, maybe you can watch it. But that, no, I don't want to watch it because I don't want the temptation. Why would I want to sit and be entertained watching someone do something that Jesus died on the cross to save us from? Is that good? That's a pretty good standard, isn't it? And then secondly, who is it that causes you to be tempted? If you're having trouble with your wife, don't go and talk to another woman at work who you might be attracted to about your marriage problems. If God set you free from an addiction and you're struggling with thoughts of going back to it, don't get around the people that are all involved in doing it and sit with them and have them influence you. Is that a good word? Because that's leading you toward temptation. And you need to pray every day, God, I want your covering over my life. I want righteousness over my life. Is that good? And God will prepare us for situations because the devil, is, he is ready to pounce. He is seeking those who he may devour. Those who are allowing him to come as the devourer. You know, Jesus already won the battle. I'm going I'm to preach the rest of this tonight. If they'll come to the instruments. You have to come tonight to hear part B. We're going to talk about praying deliverance and how to pray a hedge around yourself and how to biblically pray a hedge over your family. Let me encourage you, you ought to come. The devil wants to ensnare you. He wants to trap you. And I'll tell you what, he's got traps set. Listen to me this morning. Don't think that you are beyond the reach of the enemy. I don't want you to be overly devil conscious, but don't, don't be looking around every corner for the devil. But let me just tell you, you need to be spiritually discerning enough to know when the enemy's moving. He's been on the attack in our church, and I've been praying over our leaders. I've been praying over their families. I pray over our, our elders, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate when you come up to me and you say, Pastor Carson, I've been praying for you, and I've been praying for Jessica. We've been praying for Brooke. You don't know what that means to us, because we need that prayer covering all the time. We need to make sure that we are covered. Are you hearing me? Some of you, you tell me every week, you say, I want you to know I was praying for you this week, Pastor. And every single time you tell me, it's just like adrenaline to my spirits. Oh, yes, praise God. Are you hearing me? We need to pray. We, you know, the now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's, that's pretty, isn't it? Yeah. We need to pray a whole lot more than that. We need to pray a little bit more than God is great, God is good, let us thank him for the food, amen. We need to get serious. And some of you are saying, Pastor, I don't pray like that. I don't know how to pray. That's what this whole series is about, teaching us how to pray. But you know how you really learn to pray? You pray. You know how you really learn to pray? It's not in a seminar, it's not in a teaching, it's not in a sermon, it's praying. You say, well, I, I, I just get a block and I don't know what to pray. Let me encourage you, you know what you need to do? Get around praying people. Get around praying people while they're praying. And you pray along with them. Prayer's more caught than taught. Are you hearing me? When the ladies come in for prayer meeting on Sunday morning, get here at 8.30. Come in at 8.30, and it's mostly ladies, but some of us men are here as well, and, and we're in here for prayer. Come at 8.30. Say, well, that's too early. How important is it? How, is, is your family worth it? Are your kids worth it? Get up a little early and come and pray. Right? Are you hearing me this morning? Get around some praying people, and then just get yourself set aside. I mean, just lock the door, get aside from everyone else and everything else. Just get on your knees and you just start pouring your heart out to God. And you pray his presence right there in your prayer closet.
And I'll tell you, every time we pray, he hears. Sometimes we sense his presence and sometimes we don't. Whether we sense his tangible presence or not, he hears when his people pray. Can we just pray right now? I want us to pray protection. I want us to pray a hedge. Would you just stand so you could reach over and grab somebody by the hand so we could just join together in prayer? Oh. See, the devil has attacked. The devil has thought that he won. But Greg, the last line hasn't been written yet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He hasn't got you. No. And he's not going to get you. No. You're going to stand strong. And right now you've got somebody holding your hand. And they're lifting you up in prayer. And you're lifting them up in prayer. And as we call on the name of the Lord, we're going to pray for one another. Father, we come before you in the mighty, mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ. I thank you that you're our heavenly father. That Jesus is our big brother. I thank you for the greatness of your love for us. That we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That we can come boldly before your throne. And God, we pray your covering and your protection over us. The enemy has attacked. The enemy has come in like a flood. But now we pray of the Spirit of the Lord to raise up a standard against him. Hey, Yes, we pray the Spirit of the Lord to raise up a standard against him. Somebody that's filled with the Holy Ghost, start praying in the Spirit right now. Start praying in the Spirit right now. Holy Spirit, I pray. Yes, you're doing that deep work. God, I pray that there is that mantle of intercession upon your people, oh God. Lord, that we are not going to cower down in the face of the attack of the, of the devil, but we are going to stand strong that we're going to stand firm and that we know that indeed we may walk through the water but it's not going to overcome us that we may go through the fire but it will not burn us that we're going to come through and we're going to be victorious we thank you that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Lord, the words that come out of our mouth are words of testimony of your greatness. God, I pray deliverance over your church. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There are some of you that are here. You love the Lord. You're saved. You are as saved as you can get. God could not love you anymore. But you're walking in bondage in an area of your life. And you need deliverance over something. God wants to set you free. He who the Son sets free is not partially free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. I need somebody to start praying deliverance. You're holding hands with somebody. You may not know what they're struggling with, but they're struggling this morning. And right now, God wants to use you to pray deliverance over them. Deliverance. Maybe they're struggling with a mindset. Maybe they're struggling with something they can't get over in their mind. And right now, we pray the delivering power of the Holy Ghost. Maybe they're struggling with a habit. Maybe they're struggling with sin that they used to have that's trying to come back. And the devil's trying to put it back on them. Come on, church, pray. God's called you to pray. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's our responsibility. Oh, yes. Lord, we pray the delivering power of the Holy Ghost over this church. The delivering power of the Holy Ghost over this church. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Lord, you're the deliverer. God, you are the one that sets us free. You're the conqueror, oh God. Oh, Yes, God. 
Hallelujah. Lord, you're setting somebody free right now. Come on, church, pray. Somebody's being set free. Somebody's being delivered. Site me Sunday. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your touch this morning. Oh, God, we thank you. You're walking these aisles this morning. You're touching lives, even right now. God, do a deep work. Do a, a sanctifying work in the hearts of your people. Holy Ghost, I pray you would get a hold of us. Get a hold of us. Holy Ghost, get a hold of us and do that work, God, that you desire to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Church, hear me this morning. I need to tell you one more thing. We know the battles we've been facing. We know what we've come through, and we can tend to pray about that. But I just want us to take a moment because there are some things that are in front of you that you don't know. There are some things that the devil has planned that you don't know that you're going to be facing. But you have a God who already does. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever and ever and ever more. He's already been to your tomorrow. He's your deliverer and he's already prepared the way. And right now we need to pray the covering of God over us. Mm. Mm. Are you hearing me? We need to pray for where we're going. We need to pray for where God's going to lead us. Because where he's leading, we don't know yet, but we're just going to follow him every step of the way. That way may get a little bit rocky, but he's going to keep on leading. Come on, would you just take somebody by the hand and start praying for where they're heading. God, we pray for where we're going. God, you're leading and you're guiding and you're directing. Yes, God. And there shall no evil befall us. Neither any plague come near our dwelling. Oh, Rashandara Masotai. Because you're covering over us, oh God. We pray, Lord, for tomorrow. We pray for this week. We pray for the path that you're leading us on. Because, God, it's a path not to defeat, but a path to victory. Don't let the enemy have any advantage in our lives. God, help us to be led by your Holy Spirit. Help us to walk in righteousness for your name's sake. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. God, help us to walk in freedom and in liberty so that we could be used of you. That captives would be set free in Conneaut, Ohio. That the lost would be saved. That those who have been bound would be delivered that those that are walking in darkness will see a great light oh thank you God indeed for chains being broken hallelujah 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 God, we willingly accept the mantle of intercession that you have placed upon us. Help us to rise to the occasion as intercessors and to pray like we've never prayed before. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Could somebody just praise the name of the Lord because he's the deliverer.